Thank you, Keen. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Ashling Swain. I'm Professor of Peace, Security and International Law at the Sutherland School of Law at University College Dublin. I'm delighted to chair this event and thank the EA for inviting me to do so. And my own background is actually in working on the Women, Peace and Security agenda, which I'll, I'll explain to you now in a moment. Um, I is working in emergency women's rights in those contexts and then working globally with UN Women, UN headquarters in New York around the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda and the resolutions that we're going to discuss today. Um, I have a PhD in international law. My own main areas of research are on international security policy and law and violence against women and conflict. Um, so I'm really looking forward to our speaker to share with us today. Um, but the topic of today's conversation then is uh, women, peace, and in those of us as yet unfamiliar with the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, it refers to a set of 10 resolutions adopted by the UN Security um, Council, which have now become a standing agenda item on the annual calendar of the Council, which is why it's referred to as an agenda. The agenda was inaugurated by the Council adoption of Resolution 1325 in October 2000. It's probably one of the most infamous resolutions or decisions of the Council um, to date in the, in the history of, of the Council for all the right and wrong reasons, I would say. Um, the significance of that resolution was that it was the first time that the UN Security Council actually recognised that the, um, you know, women's rights were of concern to its mandate, which is the maintenance of international peace and security. Uh, just to kind of get us all on the same page, what you will hear the speakers referring to, and I'll just outline briefly, is what's referred to as the pillars of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And I know you'll all speak across those in various ways. The UN Women, Peace and Security Resolutions are estimated to have about 2,000 provisions or actions or commitments across the 10 resolutions. So it gets a lot to keep track of, of what they're actually trying to do. And so what policymakers have done is categorize those across four pillars. And so they're called the pillars of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. So when we say pillars, what we mean is four areas. The first is the prevention of conflict and women's leadership and gendered approaches to conflict prevention and um, protection. So the protection of women's human rights, including and particularly gender based violence related to conflict participation. So women's participation in peace processes, in peace building, and as we'll hear today in peacekeeping and then relief and recovery. So taking gendered approaches or ensuring women's rights are centralized within humanitarian relief and response and then the recovery in the aftermath of conflict. So by shorthand, we have a set of pillars around which this agenda and policymakers engage on it to implement it. We're now heading towards the 25th anniversary of the agenda, which is kind of hard to believe. And I remember when it was first adopted. So that's how old I am. Um, and we've much to discuss today as a result. We are joined by an esteemed panel of speakers to do so. Um, and I'll outline them first here and then introduce them properly. So I am joined by Dr. Sally Ann Corcoran, who is an Irish Research Council scholar. Ms. Sophie McGuirk from the Peace and Stability Unit of the Department of Foreign Affairs, and Major General Maureen O'Brien, retired former Deputy Military Advisor in the United Nations Office of Military Affairs at the UN Department of Peace um, Operations. So before we begin to hear from our speakers, let me outline how today's event will work. We'll hear from each of our speakers for five to seven minutes each. We'll then engage with each other here um, for another few minutes. I'll then open up the floor to Q&A for those of you here in the room, as well as those of you, you joining us online. Um, for those of you here in the room, I'll ask you to show any indication of interest so I can gauge how many people want to ask questions. For those of you online, you are free to post your questions on the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. Um, and you can put up your questions at any time there during the course of the proceedings just now. Um, for both sets of Q&A, if I could ask you please to identify yourself and your affiliation so we know um, and we can engage with you. I'd like to remind you that um, today's presentation and the Q&A are all on the record. And you are more than welcome to join us in a debate online on this um, with the to tag the handle of at IIEA. So let us begin. I am going to turn to our speakers now one by one. Our first speaker is Dr. Sally Ann Corcoran. Dr. Corcoran served with the UN for nearly two decades in the human rights, political and gender areas. 
Her HQ posts included UNOG, UNOHCHR, UNICEF and WHO. Her field posts have included Haiti, Dominican Republic, Croatia and Cyprus. As an Irish research scholar, she received her PhD in law at the Irish Centre for Human Rights in Galway University uh, in 2022. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. I think. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as you can see by this book that I'm holding, I just recently published a book. Actually, it's just come out on the 24th on, um, let me just go ahead here. Yes, on gender equality in UN peacekeeping, informed by my nearly two decades in the UN and what I saw on the ground. And the book basically looks at, um, I won't go into the context because uh, Dr. Swain has covered that, but basically um, I think what is important about the Women, Peace and Security agenda is that recent research has shown that more gender, the more gender equal a state is, the less likely that state is to engage in violent conflict. So I think there is quite an impetus on all to, um, to make sure that this agenda is implemented in practice. So implementation. So my, I looked at how was the agenda, the 10 resolutions, how were they put into practice internally within the UN organizational context and externally in the countries in which the UN operates? Because peacekeeping, one of the goals, I guess, aspirational goals of peacekeeping was that, was that it would be a locus for dissemination of both human rights, human rights norms, including gender equality. So I looked at that. And so my question is, has it helped advance women's equality and empowerment in the peacekeeping context and more broadly in the last almost 25 years? Um, so I just wanted to say uh, that there are qualitative and quantitative strategies Firstly, there have to be a sufficient number of women throughout the UN in positions of leadership, but all through and in different staff categories, the military, UN police, and civilian political positions. Um, I know uh, Maureen will speak to the military end of that when it's her turn. But um, I think what's important about, you know, many people criticize uh, gender quotas. But I think what's important is if women and men were treated in the same fashion, they would show up in equal numbers. The fact is that they are not. So we need corrective measures to ensure equal participation so that peace accords and operations can benefit from the perspective of both men and women. So Cantor's critical mass theory stipulates that when a minority group gets past 30%, there's real influence on an organization or on a group. So, so that's kind of the target. Um, for many of these resolutions past 30%, 33% or something along those lines. And then what's really important though is qualitative change. Has the agenda in the nearly 25 years that it has been uh, approved, um, has, how has it acted on structures on the ground, both internally UN institutional structures, um, but also physical structures and, and also structures in the host country? The, the intent of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, the spirit of it, if you will, or the intent writ large is gender equality and a, a greater, um, greater equality for women and greater empowerment and greater agency to women in all contexts. So what needed to change? What, what are the structures that needed to change internally and externally in order for that to happen? Well, I'm just gonna quickly reference that I'm not even talking about metaphysical structures right now, even physical structures like camp structures, like protective equipment that adequately protect a woman's physique. I mean, everything was modeled on the male model, the male comparator or the male referent. Um, so we have, to this day, uh, many militaries don't have boots that adequately fit women conscripts. I know Maureen will may perhaps allude to all of that, so I won't spend more time on it, but, um, so equal access, equal participation, access to decision-making, and also the resources to implement those decisions. So what my research found is that a nominal quantitative versus a qualitative structural change has happened after, well, we now have you know, more than 24 years of the agenda. So just in 2000, women were 1% of UN personnel. So I'm referring to troops and police. And today they're nearly 10%. So there has been a modest increase numerically, but it's still not anywhere near that uh, tipping point, the critical mass theory point of 30 to 33%. So what impacts on implementation? What impacts on structures 
um, allowing more equal participation for women. Participants in my research talked about obviously the number that, and especially numbers of women in senior leadership that, that are in decision-making capacity. Um, and as I mentioned, a critical mass is needed to enable sustained cultural change. Um, individual accountability for implementation of the agenda and so, so and specific penalties tied to specific individuals. We, we haven't gotten there yet. Although the last, the latest iteration of the Women, Peace and Security Policy, which I believe was October 2023, is much more specific and talks about physical changes as well and even has you know, child care and other, other things mentioned. Um, another thing that's quite important is the use of gender desegregated data to render inequities visible. And the UN has not gotten there yet either. When I did my own research, which I concluded in 2021, so I analyzed the period 2000 to 2021, um, there, there was a lot of, the, many of the missions didn't have any gender desegregated data. So, um, you know, we, we need that. So in order to really get a good picture of the, uh, the reality and to co have corresponding policies that address it. Obviously committed and accountable leadership and also the, um, the uh, composition of leadership. As I said, the leadership needs to include women and um, the magic bullet of political will. So a little bit more in the findings. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, so my research showed that normative uptake has outpa outpaced application. One minute left, okay. So there has been a clear positive UN policy progression in terms of gender policy in the 21 years I looked at. Has that trickled down into operational protocols on the ground? Somewhat, but really no. And I won't get into the patriarchal cultural no norms. Maureen will address the composition of global military structures perhaps. But the main barrier is still attitudinal, but I wanted to end on a, on a, on a positive note, which is that what the, the, the surprise in my research, uh, the big reveal is that the UN actually has made a difference um, furthering gender equality mandates at the local level in, in which missions operate. So those same gender equality mandates that perhaps were not internalized adequately within the UN itself have made a huge difference in the countries where the UN operates. And um, at, during the q and I can tell you exactly what those are. <laughs> Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you, Thanks. Great. And we'll move on now to McGuirk. McGuirk works in the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs in the Peace and Stability Unit. Her work is particularly focused on the Women, Peace and Security agenda and on peace building. Sophie previously served in the Consular Directorate of the department and she holds a BA in European Studies from Trinity College Dublin and an advanced master's in European in integration from the Vrier Universitat in Brussels. Great. Um, thanks, thanks, Ashling. Um, thanks to the organizers and to Kian for, um, for setting up this event. Um, I'm going to speak um, briefly about um, the work more so that the department does, the role of government in, in WPS policy. Um, I'll give some reflections on our time on the Security Council back in 2021-22, kind of some highlights of, of Ireland's work there. And then to finish off, I'll just briefly speak about our um, National Action Plan, which um, many of you may be familiar with. Um, so Ireland is long-standing champion of the WPS agenda, and we've co-sponsored all of the, the 10 resolutions that, that make up the agenda. Um, and the Peace and Stability Unit, which is the unit that I work in in the department, is the central government lead on, on WPS policy um, for Ireland. Um, and WPS is all about this idea of gender mainstreaming. So this is the idea that there are uh, all the implications for both men and women are included in, in planned policy actions, in programmes. And, and this is kind of what government and, and DFA was, we are trying like, specifically to do. In, um, in our foreign and in our development policies. Um, we mainly work at the kind of international and, and normative level in, in DFA. So this is mostly through, through the UN and um, a couple of other international fora as well, like OS, OSCE or, or NATO. Um, and basically we're working quite closely with colleagues um, at our permanent mission um, in New York to the UN on um, integrating and mainstreaming WPS into the discussions that are, are being held there. So kind of pushing for strong language and strong uh, gender perspectives in 
in resolutions, in, in programming at the UN, and, um, and, and to push for stronger accountability mechanisms, um, and to create a safe space for women to participate um, at the UN there. Um, we've been encouraging other, other member states at the UN to do the same as well. Um, we're also ensuring that those, those four pillars of, of WPS that Ashing mentioned earlier um, are integrated too into the department's um, development work. Um, we support a lot of women's rights organizations um, across the world and particularly in Africa where we have quite a strong focus and the chunk of our development work is, is being done there. Um, and then the other kind of major piece that we work on in the uh, Peace and Stability Unit mm -hmm. is um, the, we lead on Ireland's National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. Um, and we also act as Secretariat of the Oversight Group, which is the, the group that oversees the implementation of this whole of government plan, which I'll, I'll come to um, in, in a little bit as well. Um, kind of in keeping with that important like high level work that we're doing um, on the UN, um, I can kind of provide a couple of, of highlights from our time on, on the Security Council. Um, you're probably aware WPS was a really big and important priority for, for Ireland during its time on the Council. Again, seeking to mainstream it into Council discussions um, and, and to embed those gender perspectives kind of across the work of the Council. Um, so that was on country files, peacekeeping files, thematic files. Um, and we've, we've again urged like the current council members to, to keep up that momentum and, and keep it moving. Um, we did share our, um, the UN's um, informal expert group on WPS during that time, um, which is kind of uh, brings together um, countries and experts at the working level to kind of work more systematically on, on WPS. And, and we led the first ever um, field visit to Lebanon in, in June, 2022. Um, another piece of important work that we focused on was bringing the voices of, of civil society um, members to the council. Um, so during Ireland's presidency, we, we had uh, 17 civil society briefers um, who came to the council and to speak on specific um, uh, conflict affected countries at the time. Uh, 16 of these were women, um, and, and this uh, this uh, set a record for um, the highest participation of women at the council um, at the time, um, which kind of leads in as well to probably our, our a key achievement too from the Security Council was the the creation of a WPS presidency trio. Um, this was together with Mexico and and Kenya, and um, we kind of made a commitment to to mainstream and to prioritize WPS throughout the respective presidencies of of um, ourselves and, and those other two countries. Um, and this formed into um, a, shadow, a set of signed shared commitments, they're called, which have been built upon ever since. So we have over uh, 20 current and former UN Security Council members that have now adopted the shared commitments to, um, to really focus on implementing and bringing WPS to the forefront of the agenda at the council. Um, and then lastly, I will speak a little bit about our National Action Plan. Um, so DFA leads on Ireland's NAP, we call it, um, to, to shorten it um, a little bit. We're currently implementing the third NAP, which will expire at the end of this year. Um, and then as of um, next year, 2025, we, we'll be launching um, Ireland's fourth um, National Action Plan. So we're kind of in the initial development phases um, of that at the moment, and that'll be a big priority for us going forward. Um, the NAP is also structured across those, those four important pillars. Um, and, and, um, there's an oversight group, which oversees the, the implementation of the NAP. Um, so it's a whole of government policy. It's, it's not just DFA doing this on our, um, by ourselves. Um, there's a very strong focus on domestic application of the NAP. And we were one of kind of the first countries to, to have that approach as well. Um, so we have colleagues from various different departments um, who are sitting on that oversight group and who are also ensuring that um, these policies and these commitments are actually being met. Um, so the group is composed of uh, civil, half civil society, half government departments. Okay, one minute. Um, and we have adopted kind of a more uh, intersectional approach in the NAP as well. So this approach kind of recognizes that women are not one big homogenous group and that they can face conflict in various different forms and, and also face various different forms of discrimination as well. Um, 
based on different factors in gender, sexuality, um, religious basis. Um, so we've tried to incorporate all of that in our, our national action plan. Um, there's also a couple of focus countries that we have in the plan, um, which DFA is really kind of honing in on engaging um, on the ground in those contexts as well and trying to take then those lessons shared, lessons learned and kind of um, inject them into our work done at the normative level. Um, yeah, so I mean, just our just finish on our priorities, just going forward, um, to continue that um, important engagement um, at the normative level and kind of keep up the momentum from Security Council. Um, the the NAP will be a big priority for us as well in in the in the next couple of um, months, and to kind of have a real focus um, on accountability, um, and then um, continuing our development work and trying to kind of bridge a gap between. The work that's being done on the ground and the work that's being done at these um, high level, high level fora. Um, so that's kind of the aim of the peace and stability unit. And that's what we'll be doing going forward. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Wonderful. Great to hear what the department um, is doing and that the new NAP is coming along. That's good to hear. Great. Um, and so our final speaker is Major General Maureen O'Brien, retired. Uh, Major General O'Brien is a native of Galway City. She graduated from the University of Galway with a BSc and a HDIP in education before being awarded a cadetship in Oakley Meharan in 1981. In 2021, the Major General served as Deputy Military Advisor to the UN Under Secretary General for Peace Operations. She is Ireland's first female officer to reach the rank of Major General. Um, during her career, the Major General has amassed extensive overseas experience including as Acting Force Commander in UNDOF in Syria, and prior to that, UN peacekeeping experience in Lebanon, Western Sahara, Timor-Leste and Chad. She has also worked with OSCE in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and has recently retired from Oleg Naharan. Over to you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I want to discuss and talk about the figures and everything that we have had working in the Office of Military Affairs. While I was Deputy Military Advisor, I was physically located in the Office of Military Affairs. And I want to tell you about what we did to try and ensure that we increase the number of participants of, of women in the peacekeeping missions, um, as mandated by UN Resolution 1325 and other successive resolutions, which recognize the importance of women's participation in peace operations, not just as victims, but also those who can positively impact peace. Um, we wanted to ensure in the Office of Military Affairs that our uniform component is diverse and inclusive of women, reflective of the communities that we serve on the ground. There's no point in having an all male environment um, which isn't uh, reflective of the community that we work in. First of all, I'll talk about numbers. It's a bit dry, but we have a uniformed gender parity strategy which started in 2018 and it reaches 2028, which sets in incremental targets each year in different categories of pers military personnel. We have staff officers who should be located in headquarters, either at a, a mission headquarters or a sector headquarters. Uh, military observers who ob observe potentially um, um, treaties, adherence to treaties and ensuring that one party is not um, increasing the military participation, etc. But also contingent members, the vast majority of soldiers are personnel on the ground are parts of contingents. And there are approximately 77,000 military personnel on the ground at any one time, and they can increase and decrease from that. So as, as Dr. Cochran mentioned, the percentage of military and um, our uniform personnel is about 9.4-10%. And, and it's worth taking a look at a breakdown of those figures from the military perspective. In 2018, for staff officers and military observers together, because they would be working individually, per se. They wouldn't have troops under their command. In 2018, it was 8.2% percent, uh, percent, uh, were women. The target for 2024 was 21%. Ambitious. Nonetheless, in February 24, it is now 23.29%. So that's an excellent um, improvement. There are reasons for that. And for seconded officers, for example, in the Office of Military Affairs where I worked, we again had um, a target of 21%. In 2018, that was 9.67%. And today it is 18%. 18 but we have only got 75% of the appointments filled at the moment. And um, when I left, 
in 2023, we had 21%. That's not because I left that it went down, but you, you know, it's just the way it happens, yeah? But it's in the contingents where the vast majority of our personnel are, and they're the people who meet the, the people on the ground. Um, so in 2018, they were three point, women were 3.9% and the target for 2024 was 11%. Today, we have a figure of 74 Not bad, but much more can be done. And there are difficulties within that category as well, which I'll allude to. So here that... Um, the point is, actually, OMA can try to have targets, but it's entirely down to the troop contributing nations who they deploy at any one time. In 2018, rep, uh, women represented about 5% of a TCC, the troop contributing countries, military personnel. However, they were primarily medical and, other, and held other support roles. In some troop contributing countries, women are not employed in what they call uh, combat roles, uh, infantry soldier roles. Some have started to include these women um, in the infantry, but it will take time for them to um, reach leadership positions. It can take uh, about 30 to 40 years to grow a general, you know. But in some TCCs, women are not included in professional development courses, which, require, which are a requirement for um, senior rank. Uh, which leads me to the point that whereas numbers are important and it's very important that they are measured, um, it's not all about numbers. In 2019, for example, there were two female force commanders and two female deputy force commanders in, in the 12 peacekeeping missions at the time. Today, there are none. Um, it's only at these levels that, that women can make huge changes and affect change, to be very honest. Force commanders, deputy force commanders, and other senior appointments do not have do will not come from the support end of the forces. They will come through the combat end in general. So it's only in TCCs like Sweden, Norway, Australia, Ghana to a certain extent, and Ireland, where women are fully integrated in the force and as part of the infantry unit. Um, that's where we will get the leader, senior leader holders at uh, for the future. But it will change in time. Um, but the Office of Military Affairs has also made efforts to ensure that the troop contributing nations include women in their deployments. And there's a number of ways that we have tried to do that. And it is about carrot and stick and it is about blackmail, but nonetheless, it it's, has to be done. So the number of staff officers appointments held by TCC in a mission are in part determined by the number of the size of their contingent. Um, so OMA also prioritized appointments, staff officer appointments to those troop contributing nations who include a large number of females. So if all else is equal, we will look at the female participation in the, in the contingent and uh, appoint uh, staff officers in the in staff officers role according to that. We also, um, um, in each unit that is deployed has what we call a statement of unit requirements. And in that, it tells you, you must have X number of personnel, you must have this equipment, you must have that. But also in it, we state that they must include female participants. Now, we've only had difficulty with one, maybe two TCCs, but they have included when, when we made them <laughs> in a diplomatic sense. Um, since the start of 2021, uh, an infantry unit must include an engagement platoon, uh, the purpose of which is to help with civil military interaction. Um, and that engagement platoon um, originally was 100 percent. And I had a big difficulty with that because for me, that essentialized women into one role. And so if I have very few women and if it's only five percent of one's force, why would you then just pick them out to do a particular role, which is engagement? Um, so um, I saw that. So we have now decided, and the new new role is that is fifty percent men and fifty percent women. Again, reflecting the people on the ground. Um, we distribute gender disaggregated data in so far as we have it, and as we call it, the gender imbalance statistics on a monthly basis to TCCs to essentially name and shame. Uh, for seconded appointments in OMA, we came up, and I say we, I mean me, uh, came up with a, a way of. Uh, troop contributing countries can nominate a number of people for any one job. We decided that 25% must be female. Um, but for senior roles, they don't all, the TCC doesn't necessarily have females in, the, in those positions. So they may only nominate three men. Now that caused absolute consternation. Uh, 
Um, but what we're hoping from that is that we'll ensure that that TCC will, will go back and say we must educate and give the professional qualifications to our female personnel as well in order that we'll get more uh, um, opportunities for the men. Anyway, if it works, we don't mind. Um, the Department of Support, and something I might um, talk about in the questions, has also talked about, oh no, sorry, has done some work with ELSI, um, a Canadian organization, which seeks to increase our, um, improve the accommodations for women, to make them more suitable for women. Having said that, the accommodations for men are atrocious. So um, I think um, what we want to do is raise the tide for everybody. So it's not about numbers. Um, we have pointed out that the most important thing when I meet and when we met uh, with the USG for peace operations and the TCCs, the ministers and the chiefs of defence that came, is that if they don't include women, they are operationally less effective. And that's a simple fact. I don't have to prove it to anybody. It is just the way it is. So um, it's amazing how when we say that the cultural reservations that they may have had seem to dissipate somewhat, especially if we point out that their neighboring country with which they may have issues with has increased the number of females and has started having females in infantry units. Um, and finally then, um, yeah, in the UN headquarters, what we did is a very senior uh, appointment. We did leadership, um, gender responsive leadership courses. Um, and each department now and office has to include goals and actions to encourage inclusivity and gender, uh, ensure gender is mainstreamed into our plans, all plans. And because gender mainstreaming is everybody's business, we now insist that all personnel appraisal, appraisals include an assessment of an individual's input into the departments and offices, gender and diversity goals. So we, um, We've done a lot of work, but again, a lot of it is down to the, the troop contributing country itself. As the saying goes, a lot done, more to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great, fascinating um, remarks from all of you to kickstart our conversation. And thank you. Um, before I get to pose a question to you then and kickstart us off, just to remind you all that um, I'll, I'll invite Q&A now in a couple of moments. For those of you online, please do post them up on the Q&A section of the Zoom screen. And for those of you here, get your questions ready. And please remember to let us know who you are and your affiliation and to tweet at IIEA, please, online. Um, so I'm sitting here and it suddenly struck me as I was listening to all of you how interesting it is that we have someone from government, we have someone from military, and we have someone from civic society and academia. And how remarkable it is that while you've talked about very different things, there's themes that run through what you've been speaking about. One of them is barriers, which I think you've said quite clearly. And I want to come back to um, Dr. Corkin, so I'll give you a chance to do that. Um, and also opportunities, right? And, and that there are opportunities and often with policy areas like the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, what we have seen is the agenda itself has pushed open space um, to advance women's rights and gender equality issues quite concretely in a ways that I think many of us wouldn't imagine was possible by the agenda when it was first adopted. But at the same time that constraints have arisen that restrict what those possibilities can be and mean in practical terms, I think for the likes of your own organizations and your work, but also for people and communities on the ground affected by conflict, most importantly. Um, sally Ann, you said something really important about um, how originally the spirit of the Women, Peace and Security agenda was about gender equality. And I, for one, for sure, have been in so many rooms globally where that has simply been forgotten. Mm. And it has been lost almost as a central pivot of the agenda. So next year, we are 25 years. And I wondered if you all could say something um, that you might want to think about for that 25 year moment. What are the opportunities now? What are constraints or barriers for the areas that you look at? You know, what I imagine is going to happen next year is there going to be a flurry of activity in New York to celebrate this agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can hear that mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And that's good because we should absolutely celebrate this. Across the life of the agenda, there has been significant feminist critique and intersectional critique, as we call it, where this agenda has served some women and not others, mm -hmm. where it has pushed particular aspects that states are interested in, has not pushed open other areas that women themselves might prioritize. So there's lots of complexity with this agenda. It's not simply, here's this thing, let's move forward. There's been a push and pull over the last 25 years. 
what would you like to see celebrated next year that you think is the win? What do you think are the barriers and opportunities that we need now for the next 25 years of the agenda? Um, Major General, would you like to start and we'll work back this way just for two to three minutes yeah. and then we give time for everyone else to engage with us? Uh, I will say from a military perspective, there still are barriers, but I would um, hope that, you know, people, particularly women and, um, and men as well, ask questions when there are barriers there. I spent 42 years in Irish Defence Forces asking questions, why not? And if I didn't, I'd still be, I was a teacher for a while, I'd still be a teacher in, in Jamaican Convent in Cabra where I started off, you know, so you have to push yourself and you have to, so I think to raise our ambitions, I think we have to raise it and, and to be more powerful, more vocal about where there are um, injustices. I mean, and, and, and it can be just very subtle. It can be what the words we use. Um, um, yeah. What do you think, what would you like the next 25 years to look like? And what would you think the key thing for your area that you want to see change in and commitment from? I want to see the, the male leaders cop on to themselves. <laughs> that, you know, that's the quote of the event, I think. <laughs> but seriously, yeah. in terms of a military, operational mm -hmm. effectiveness is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. And if you, if you do not have... Uh, diversity and inclusivity mm -hmm. you're not you're going to get the same think yes exactly. the same way of thinking constantly mm -hmm. and um I, I think including women not only allows a different voice and we're not homogenous as Sophie has said as well we have mm -hmm. different voices but it also gives space for men who mm -hmm. are are afraid to voice their opinion they don't think the same either mm -hmm. so it gives a space for them to do that thank so you. I'm hoping that that's Good. what will come forward thank from you. it thank you it's wonderful yeah. to hear your thoughts Sophie um, I guess kind of to pick up on your point on not male leaders specifically, mm -hmm. but but leaders, um, I would think and well, I would hope that the 25th anniversary will be kind of um, raise the profile of WPS and kind of instill a little bit more political will mm -hmm. into the agenda, because I think that's something major that's that's lacking mm -hmm. because it's all it's all kind of well and good for for those of us who are working directly on it to, to kind of go around and preach the importance of, of WPS. But the, the it's very hard to to get that political mm -hmm. buy-in um and and this varies massively as well depending on 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 each country and their and their context as well um and i mean also with just the proliferation of conflicts yeah. in the last couple of years too I, I would you know hope that it's kind of an opportunity to reflect and understand that it, it's so important to have this integrated um into discussions around conflict resolution and, and peace building and um, that it can be used and applied today mm -hmm. um, and that it can be a, a major a major benefit. And then the other thing I would say is um, a stronger push for accountability, um, which again is what I think we see as a major as a major gap and certainly like at that normative level as well. Um, obviously despite the the resolutions and mm -hmm. the discussions um, and um and even kind of um policies that are in place that in national context as well it's quite hard to have that accountability mechanism and and to make sure that commitments are being met and that um that states who who promote the the wps agenda including ourselves that we're that we're meeting um the the commitments and we're practicing what we preach so mm -hmm. they'd be the two main things i think from our side thank you so for me, I would say I'll start with the positive. Great. That I do. That surprisingly, given my my cynical nature, um, there have been a lot of wins in the in the three operations that I looked at: Timor Leste, um, in Timor Leste, and in Lebanon um, and Mali. There were uh, the gender equality mandate was successfully implemented. There were local wins in local contexts. So I'd love to see more of that, and that requires. Um, very precise and specific planning to make sure those objectives happen. Mm -hmm. And I really hope to see more of that, you know, with, okay. with I know that, you know, in peacekeeping, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's been, that's quite positive and I hope we see more. And then on a little bit of a, perhaps a little less positive note, um, the accountability issue, I have to stress as, as both of you have. Um, and I mean, the other thing is that the, the Women, Peace and Security agenda has, it, it 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 wasn't in 1996 the UN had also a similar mm -hmm. similar administrative policy that basically was 
quite it was, it was almost identical and yet um you know we still have a lot a long way to go in terms of reform mm -hmm. institutional reform so i really hope that um in in any organization or in any institution what's valued is what is seen and implemented and budgeted for and i, I left out resources which i think is really important mm -hmm. because um if, if there's no budget and if there's still bias in recruitment and human resources, then we really aren't going as far as we should to implement the, the agenda okay. and to have equal participation. Fantastic. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of you have a burning question you want to ask each other? I mean, listen to each other. I, I just yeah. one comment, and yeah. it's just um, and hope for 2025 mm -hmm. that all discussions and seminars on women resolution 1325. Do not include all female panels <laughs> and almost entirely female. You know, it's just yeah, I find yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're still we're still very much in that space in in mm -hmm. various areas of global policy. I would say, yeah. um, and with the women, peace, and security agenda, it has tended at global levels, not the council. Even if you're I've sat in the Security Council debates, the council is suddenly full of women, mm -hmm. and every other day of the year, there's mm -hmm. barely any in there, right? Yeah. So it it is um how we change the rhetoric around what women's rights are. That that, that as you said, it's and I think you've said as well for everybody that raise all time boats right and yeah. uh, advance this in a way that is substantive change and qualitative change for societies anything else you have anything else sophie um i thought it was interesting um what you mentioned maureen about um that there's very there's quite an, an increase in in women participating um in in military but there's so few women at the at the top level which is where the real change can be made so i think it's trying to it's important to take that into account and try and kind of i guess integrate that the, the change and, and to keep it going so that women can reach that level where change can be made because there's no point in having a couple of token women to, to reach a quota if if their voices aren't being heard if they're at yeah, that kind of level absolutely. and and i visited all the as deputy military advisor i visited all the the uh, missions it's very important to be seen right. uh, and, and being visible and even as a battalion commander here in in dundalk I had to be seen on the ground, to be seen mm -hmm. as being the lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. at that time in charge of the, because mm -hmm. it is, people, if you can't see it, you can't be it, all of that kind of thing. Okay. And it, it normalizes um, mm -hmm. women in, in those roles. Sure. And you'd be happy to note that the current deputy military advisor only is, is a woman from Australia. And um, yeah, so there's still that leadership there at that level as well. But just one final word, I guess, on culture change, on real culture change. Um, if we look at, you know, the Italians, for example, I'm not trying to, you know, bring the Italians down today, but they only allowed women in any capacity in the armed forces in the year 2000. Really? So how can you possibly, um, how can mm -hmm. Italy, as a true contributing country, contribute women at all? let alone in any leadership positions when they have been totally when and and you know not not allowed at all you know, sure. and the other thing is about um this cultural relativism like it's our culture mm -hmm. we don't have women doing those things mm -hmm. our women do these things well it, human rights you know it's a whole normative relative argument mm -hmm. but i think that we need to be very clear about that well it's the un culture that yes. This is the way it's done, and if you want to, and I said that to one particular TCC when I was looking to see if all the military police units had women in them, mm -hmm. and surprisingly, well, not surprising, you know, the TCCs are providing, they didn't, and I said to one particular TCC, you have to have women in it for the next rotation, and he said, well, it's not our culture, and I said, but it is the UN culture, and we can replace you tomorrow morning if you don't. <gasps> <laughs> well, we can't really, but you know, yeah. <laughs> that's great. But that's what it is. Yeah. We do need more of that, and, and directive commands. You know that um, this this is yeah. the norm, yeah. exactly. right? That that there is a norm yeah. that that is egalitarian, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's the important message.